Hello, and welcome to phase three of this basic biblical Greek course. Uh, we are starting with lesson 16 specifically today. So let's take a look at an overview of the contents that we will be covering in this lesson. We will be starting with uh, an overview of liquid verbs. And then more specifically, we will deal with the future active and middle of liquid verbs. Thereafter, we'll look at the aorist, active, and middle liquid verbs. And then we will learn the form of the future indicative of AME. And finally, we'll finish with some vocabulary and translation work. Uh, so grab a cup of coffee and let's get going. So, an important introductory question that we need to begin with in this lesson is, what are liquid verbs? Well, firstly, liquid verbs are those whose stems end in the letters or consonants lambda, mu, nu, or rho. Now, why are they called liquid verbs? Well, these consonants are called liquid verbs because their sounds are frictionless and keep, can be pronounced like a vowel. So they essentially flow as opposed to remaining mute. So here's three examples of liquid verbs. We have men no, spay ro, and ba lo. All right, verbs whose stems end in either lambda, mu, nu, or ro. And when you actually pronounce them, they are frictionless. They flow like vowels as, a, as opposed to remaining mute. And then the last important point to, to know is that these liquid verbs form a special group. Why is that? It's because they do not accept the attachment of the sigma of the future tense or the sigma alpha of the first aorist tense. Okay, so I think if there's anything that you want to grasp about liquid verbs, it's that they form a special group. And those are the two reasons why they don't accept the sigma of the future and they don't accept the sigma alpha of the first aorist tense. And we will unpack um, this in more detail as we go along in this lesson. So as we continue learning about liquid verbs, we have to do a little bit of revision from lesson nine. And in lesson nine, we focused on contract verbs. So let me give you some background or, or context to why we need to do some revision of contract verbs. Well, it's because of this. The future of liquid verbs is formed by adding an epsilon suffix before the personal ending. In other words, in the future active indicative, the sigma is replaced by an epsilon. All right, so remember in the previous slide, I said to you that uh, liquid verbs, they form a special group. And one of the reasons was is because in the future tense, they don't accept the sigma. And here I'm showing you that the sigma is replaced by the epsilon. And because the epsilon is a vowel that comes before the personal ending, there's going to be contraction uh, that will take place. So in lesson nine, we learned that a contract vowel, specifically here we're dealing with the epsilon, it can also be an omicron or an alpha, but uh, only the epsilon applies to the liquid verbs. So the contract vowel contracts with the vowels of verb endings to form one new vowel or diphthong. All right, so some of you might have forgotten uh, some of the rules regarding contract verbs that we did in lesson nine. So I think it'd be worth our while to do some practice together. Uh, so let's do that now on the next slide. So the example that we looked at in lesson nine was poeo because it is a verb that ends with an epsilon. So let's take a look at the various 
forms of poieo and specifically the contraction that takes place. So let's look at the, the singulars first. So the first person singular is poi e, all right, plus the omega of the presence active indicative uh, verb ending. And the epsilon contracts with the omega to form poi o. Now I've also given you the contraction table at the bottom here just to help jottle your memory. We haven't got time to look at all the rules in detail, but let's just check if this is correct. So we're focusing specifically on the epsilon contract vowel. And then on the top here, we have the vowels of the verb endings. So when an epsilon meets an omega, we see that it becomes an omega, a lengthened um, vowel. And to show that contraction has taken place, uh, we can see here that we have a circumflex over the lengthened vowel. All right, let's do the next one together. We have poi e plus ace. So the epsilon amalgamates with the diphthong, the epsilon yota, and that becomes poi ace. So let's check that. We have the epsilon plus the A, and that remains an A. And to show that contraction has taken place, we have the circumflex. All right, I'm just going through this very quickly. You can always go back to lesson nine if you want to brush up on uh, the contraction rules. Then third person singular, poi e uh, plus A. And that becomes poi a. To show that contraction has taken place, we have the circumflex. And then the first person plural, we have poi e plus amen. So we have the epsilon that contracts with the omicron, and that becomes poi u men. So let's just check that. Epsilon meets the omicron, and the contraction is u. All right, so that is correct. Then second person uh, plural, we have poi e plus ete, and that contracts to become poi e te. And then the third person plural, poi e plus usin, and that becomes poi usin. So what happens here is that the upsilon, if you remember, drops away. And then we have the contraction of the epsilon and the omicron, and that forms uh, u. So we have poi u sin. And to show the contraction has taken place, we have the circumflex above the second vowel. All right, so I hope that this example uh, has just refreshed your memory. And uh, so using this uh, revision, Let's now look at the liquid verbs and the contraction that takes place there. So let's begin with the future active of liquid verbs. And the example that we are going to work with is krino. So it's a verb that ends with a consonant, specifically the new. And that's why it is classified as a liquid verb. Now, we would have expected the future form of krino to be krinso, because we've learned that the tense formative of the future tense is a sigma. So by adding that sigma to krino, we end up with krinso. But now keep in mind, that we're dealing with liquid verbs. And so in the future active indicative of liquid verbs, the sigma is replaced by the epsilon. And so now we have krino plus an epsilon that replaces the sigma, and our result is krineo. And now because we have a contract vowel at the end, contraction is going to take place. So let's practice 
the, the contraction uh, that takes place with uh, crino. So let's take a look at the future active forms of crino. The first person singular is crine plus the omega, and we end up with crino. Uh, just keep in mind that the future tense forms take primary endings, not secondary endings. So all of these are primary endings. The second person singular is crine plus ace, and after contraction that becomes crinase. The third person singular, crene plus a, and that will end up as crene. The first person plural, crene plus amen. After contraction, that gives us crenu men. The second person plural, crene plus ete, and that results in crene te. And then the third person plural, crene plus usin, after contraction, we end up with sin. So now that we've done the, the various uh, forms of the future active, I've also given you a table of the present active verb forms. And why is that? Uh, take a look here with me. As a result, the future tense of a liquid verb looks just like or similar to the present active verb forms after contraction has taken place. So let's go through the present active verb forms of krin. So we have uh, krino, the second person singular, krinais, third person singular, Crene, first person plural, crenomen, second person plural, crenete, and third person plural, crenusin. So as you can see, they are very similar, uh, both of these forms. In actual fact, there are only two differences between them. So let me point out those differences for you. The first one is that the future active forms are characterized by a circumflex over the endings. All right, so take a look there. We have the circumflex over the endings to show that contraction has taken place. And the second difference is there are different spellings for the first and second person plural. So as you can see there, in the present active verb forms, uh, we have krenamen, and the second person plural, we have krenete. Right, and those are slightly different to the future forms, because the future forms have undergone contraction. Right, so uh, just go through this carefully again and um, make sure that you understand uh, the differences. So even though uh, these liquid verbs um, undergo contraction, the contraction doesn't affect uh, the translation. All right, so we still are going to translate it as a future tense form or, or simply put as an action that will take place in the future. So the first person is singular, krino, we translate as I will judge. The second person is singular, krenais, you will judge. Third person is singular, krene, he will judge. The first person plural, krenumen, we will judge. Second person plural, krenete, you will judge. And finally, the third person plural, krenusin, we would translate as they will judge. So, in the previous slide, I showed you that some future liquid verbs 
can only be distinguished from the present active forms by being aware of the circumflex or the spelling changes in the first and second person plural forms. But there are also some liquid verbs that change the spelling of their stem in the future. And the future forms of liquid verbs that change their stem are as follows. So here is a table that gives you a list of some of those changes that take place. So in the first column, I've given you the present forms. And in the second column, I've given you the future forms to show you the spelling changes that these liquid verbs have undergone. And in the last table, the translation of, of those verbs in the future. So we, we start off with uh, apok teno. And in the future, that becomes apok teno. Then we have I row, and the future form is a row. Then we have a gay row, and the future form is a gay row. And then we have spe row, and the future form is spe row. So what I want you to notice here is that we have the circumflex to show that a contraction has taken place. But you will also notice that the future forms have dropped the yota. Right, so just be aware of this, that liquid verbs with a, a diphthong, um, either the A or the I, usually drop uh, the yota in the future tense. Right, so let's go through those together very quickly, uh, these first four. So we have apok teno, and that becomes apok teno, without the yota. Then we have i ro, and that becomes a ro, without the yota. A gay ro becomes a gay ro, also has dropped the yota, and then spe ro becomes spe ro. All right, the next one is apotheneisko. And I want you to be aware that the true stem of apothenesco is thun. Right, so because it is a verb that ends with a new, that's why it is classified as a liquid verb. But you wouldn't see that just by looking at apothenesco. And the future form is apothenumai. Apothenumai. You can see the, the contraction that's taken place there. And then we have apostello, and that becomes apostello. It's just dropped a, a lambda. Then we have balo, and that becomes balo, also dropping the lambda. And then this one is quite a drastic change. We have lego, and the future form is ero. All right, so that's why you're just going to have to, to memorize and learn. Then we have meno, and that becomes meno in the future form, just with the circumflex to show the difference, and then krino, um, which we've been practicing, that becomes krino. And these all have the circumflex as well to show the contraction that has taken place. All right, then just regarding the translations, apokteno, we translate as I will kill, a row, I will take up. A gay row, I will raise up. Sparrow, I will sow. Apathanumai, I will die. Apostello, I will send. Balo, I will cast or I will throw. Ero, I will say. Meno, I will remain. And then Krino, I will judge. Let us now quickly look at the future middle of liquid verbs using the example of krino once again. So the first person singular after contraction has taken place, we have krinu mai. Second person singular, krine. Third person singular, krine tai. First person plural, krinu metha. Second person plural, krineis the. And third person plural, krinun tai. So as a result, the future middle of liquid verbs are very similar to the present 
middle tense verb forms as well. So let's quickly have a look at the the present middle together. The first person singular is krna mai. The second person singular krne. Third person singular krne tai. First person plural krna metha. Second person plural krnes the. And then the third person plural krnon tai. So as you can see here, um, the, the forms are very similar, but once again, there are two uh, differences. The first one is that the future middles have a circumflex over the verb endings to show that contraction has taken place. And then the sig second uh, difference is that there are spelling changes. I think all the forms have uh, slightly different spelling changes because of the contraction. Uh, the only two that are similar are the second person uh, singular forms, but the other forms have different spelling changes. And then just regarding the translation of the future middle, so although there's contraction that's taken place, it doesn't impact the translation. We still translate it as a, as a future action. So uh, the first person singular, Krenumai, you would translate as I will judge for myself. Krene, you will judge for yourself. Krenetai, he will judge for himself. The first person plural, Krenumetha, we will judge for ourselves. Kreneste, you will judge for yourselves. And then the third person plural, Krenuntai, they will judge for themselves. Because remember, with the middle voice, we know that the subject is acting. Uh, for itself or in its own interest. And so we add all the elves to the end of the translation. All right, let's transition from the future uh, tense of liquid verbs to now looking at the aorist of liquid verbs. So it says there, the first aorist active and middle of liquid verbs are formed in one of two ways. The first way is with a sigma alpha. So most first aorist verbs contain a sigma. Right, so please uh, go and uh, watch lesson 14 again because there we deal specifically with first aorist. So generally the tense formative is a sigma alpha. But every now and again, in Greek, you get exceptions. So here is an exception. The second way to form an aorist verb is without a sigma. So some verbs are first aorist without the characteristic sigma. But fortunately, there are only four liquid verbs that follow this pattern. So let's take a look at what those four verbs are. So the four verbs that follow this pattern, uh, which pattern is that again? The pattern of forming the first aorist without the tense formative of sigma are uh, meno, which in the aorist becomes e mena, and that we translate as I remained. Then we have krino, which becomes E krena. I should have used a purple underline there. And we translate that as I judged. And then we have a gay row, which becomes a gay ra, which is translated as I raised up. And then apostello in the first areas that becomes apostela, which is I sent. So let's make one or two observations uh, about these verbs. The first one is uh, when we move from the present tense to the aorist tense, we uh, need to have the augment. So you can see there that these verbs have augments. For a gay row, the epsilon has lengthened to an eta. And then because apostello is a compound uh, verb, the upper, um, in the front there, 
the Omicron uh, is then changed to an Epsilon all right to show the augment and then another observation that I want you to be aware of is that if the verb contains an epsilon so that will refer specifically to meno and to apostello if the verb contains an epsilon then the epsilon will lengthen to an a diphthong to compensate for the loss of the sigma so in the areas you can see there for meno that the epsilon has lengthened to an a diphthong to compensate for the loss of the sigma and the same goes for apostella we now have apostella where the epsilon has lengthened to a diphthong and then let's just finish with one or two observations here these are regarding uh, second aorist verbs other liquid verbs are second aorist with normal second aorist characteristics so I haven't got time to deal with the second aorist here if you want to remind yourself of the second aorist please go and watch uh, lesson 15 again but here's two examples balo becomes e balon and apathanesco becomes apathanon and then the final comment here is regarding the conjugation of these verbs the conjugations of these verbs in both the active and the middle voices are the same as the first aorist except for the omission of the sigma and the lengthening of the stem vowel where applicable so i know that this can sound confusing uh, so let's practice conjugating one or two of these verbs together so let's practice conjugating the first aorist uh, active of krino and a gay row now keep in mind that the first aorist uses secondary active uh, personal endings which i've given you you here on the bottom right hand corner so the singular endings are new sigma the third person has no personal ending the plurals are men te and new so let's go through these uh, together first we have krino so the first person singular becomes e krina and just a comment here uh, no ending is used for the first person singular in the first era so although uh, the second secondary active ending is new the first aorist uh, first person singular doesn't take that new ending so we simply have e krna then the second person singular is e krnas the third person singular is e krnen all right she has another comment no ending is used for the third person singular as you can see here but the alpha of the new alpha is changed to an epsilon right so that's why we have the epsilon there with the movable new so it's ekrene or ekrenen with the movable new the first person plural is ekrenamen second person plural ekrenate right and there we see we have a circumflex to show that contraction has taken place let's go through what's happened there the second person plural has undergone contraction all right so here we have the alpha that is contracted with the the epsilon to form the length and vowel the alpha with the circumflex to show the contraction so it's ekrenate and then the third person plural is ekrenon right and of course we have the augment to show the past tense of the action and then very quickly we have a gay row the first person singular is a gay ra. the second person singular is a gay ras third person singular a gay ren first person plural a gay ramen second person plural a gay ra te with the same contraction that's taken place as was the case with krino 
and then the third person plural, a gay ron. Right, so just keep in mind that the conjugations of these liquid verbs in both the active and middle voices are the same as the first aorist, except for the omission of the sigma and the lengthening of the stem vowel where applicable. So remember that a me is the most common verb in Greek. Uh, specifically, it is a copulative or a linking verb because it links the subject to its predicates. The predicates can either be the predicate uh, nominative or the predicate adjective. And then remember when it comes to uh, conjugating it or passing it, that it has no voice. So you pass it only with the tense, mood, person, and number. So, so far, uh, we've learned the present indicative forms of Amy. Let's go through those very quickly as a form of, re of revision. The singulars, we have Amy, which is I am, A, you are, Estin, he or she it is, is men, we are, este, you are, and asin, they are. We've also learned the imperfect indicative forms of Amy. So let's go through those together as a form of, of revision as well. The singulars, we have a main, which is I was. A, you were, ain, he, she, it, was, the plural forms, a, men, we, were, a, te, you, were, and then a, son, they, were. Now today, I'd like to introduce you to the future indicative forms of a, me. Now, before we do that, uh, a helpful tip uh, to keep in mind is that the future indicative of a me is formed by adding the primary middle passive endings to the stem s. Right, so we have s, which comes before the primary middle passive endings. So we have are my, a, ti, are metha, s the, and on tai. Now there's one exception here, uh, as you may have noticed already, and that is that the connecting vowel is omitted in the third person singular. So normally the third person singular ending is e tai. So the epsilon has dropped away. So we simply have S tie. All right, let's go through these together very quickly. The singular forms, we have S or my, which we translate as I will. The second person singular, S A, you will. Third person singular, S tie, he or she or it will. Then we have the plural forms, the first person plural, S or metha, we will, second person plural, s s there, you will, and third person plural, s on tie, they will. It's time now to do our vocabulary for lesson 16. So let's begin with the first word. We have Anna Baino, which means I go up. And uh, just to be aware of, it's a compound word. So the word ana uh, means up and baino means go. So putting those two together, we have I go up. And so is the following word, kata baino. Kata baino, which is I go down. It's also a compound verb. Kata here meaning down and baino go, so I go down. Uh, so that's pretty neat. Our next word is upper luo, upper luo, 
we've already learned that lu o means I loose. So with the upper in the front, it means I release. Then we have doxa zo, doxa zo, which is the verb form of doxa, and that means I glorify. Then we have entole hey, entole hey, which is commandment. And then we have an adjective, eschatos, eschate, eschaton, where we get our word eschatology from, the study of last things. So it means last. And notice that we're given here the masculine, feminine, and neuter forms of this adjective, because adjectives must be able to have all three genders. Then we have thalassa hay, thalassa hay, which is sea or lake. Next we have thelo, thelo, which is I will, I wish, or I desire. Then we have a word that the gospel writers use quite frequently because Jesus taught in them. We have parabole hay, parabole hay, which is parable. Next we have patho. Patho, which means I trust or I persuade. And then we have spero. We've come across this word in our lesson. Spero, a liquid verb because it ends with a, a row. And it means I sow. Then we have a third declension noun. Stoma, stomatos ta. Stoma, stomatos ta. Which means mouth. Then we have sunago, sunago. I gather together, and finally, hudo hudatos ta, hudo hudatos ta, which means water. So our first example reads as follows: Ekene he entole the duske he mas hoti hoi Andres. Our toy, apoktenusi ton iesun al egerthesatai ek ton necron kai so se he mas apa tes hamatias he mon. So let's pass four words together that are going to be important for the translation. The first one is a kene, it's a demonstrative pronoun. Nominative case, feminine gender, singular person, and we translate it as that. Our next word is Andres, and this word initially might look very foreign to you. It is a third declension noun, so it takes third declension endings, so that's why we have the Andres. But if you're not too sure about its passing information, just look at the article that comes before it. So we have here Hoy. So we know that that is a nominative masculine plural. So it's a noun. And so we translate this as men. Then we have apoktenusi. And initially you might think that this is a present tense, but you see that it has a circumflex over the upsilon indicating that uh, contraction has taken place between two vowels. So this is a liquid verb. It's a future tense. Active, indicative, third person plural. All right, so we could translate this as they will kill. And then finally, we have a gerthesitai, and you will see there the theta, eta, sigma, tense formative, showing us that this is a verb, it's a future passive voice, indicative, third person singular. And we could translate this as he will be raised up. Right, so using some of this passing information, we could come up with a translation that looks like this. That commandment is teaching us that the men themselves will kill Jesus, but he will be raised from the dead, and he will save us from our sin. So this is a very long verse. It's a complex sentence, and a lot of independent clauses have been joined by conjunctions. But I want to make one or two observations here. The first one regarding a kene, this demonstrative pronoun. 
So because it agrees in gender, number and case with the subject, which is hey, enter lay, we can see that it is modifying the subject. So it's not just the commandment, it's that commandment. Is teaching us, so here hey mas is functioning as a direct object of the transitive verb teaching. It's teaching us that the men themselves. So why have we translated the third person personal pronoun as themselves? Uh, because it agrees with the noun that comes before it in gender, number, and case. Specifically, it's a nominative masculine plural, and therefore it's functioning as an in intensive pronoun. It's intensifying um, the noun. The men themselves will do an action. They will kill Jesus, but he will be raised from the dead, and he will save us from our sin. So let's read our second example together. We have ha theos ek bale tas hamatias su a pistu ace ace auton kai so they say in te charitai autu. So let's pass three specific words together. The first one is ek bale, and this word actually comes from Ek balo. So you can see here there's a circumflex which tells us that contraction has taken place. And you'll also notice that one of the uh, lambdas has dropped out, uh, showing you that in the future tense, um, the stem of this word has changed. So this is an example of a liquid verb. So specifically, it's a future tense, active voice, indicative, third person singular. So we could translate this as he will cast out. Then our next word is so they say. And there we have the tense formative, the theta, eta, sigma, uh, showing us this is a future passive voice, indicative, second person singular. And we could translate this as you will be saved. And then finally, we have charitai, which is a third declension noun. It's a dative, feminine, singular, and the vocab is grace. So putting this information together, we could come up with the following translation. God will cast out your sins if you are believing in him and you will be saved in his grace. So let's make one or two observations here. Uh, the first one is the second person personal pronoun su, which is indicating possession of the noun tas hamatias. So it's not just God, God will cast out uh, sins, it is your sins showing possession. And then we have this a. A is a conditional particle, so it's used to introduce a condition. So that's why we use the word if. So God will cast out your sins if you do something. And that something is if you are believing. Pistuase. And then we have a preposition ace that's followed by the third person personal pronoun auton. So auton is in the accusative case, and the reason that it's in the accusative case is because it is the object of the preposition ace. So it's believing in him and you will be saved in his grace. All right, so this preposition in takes its case, its object in the date of case, and that's why te charitai is in the date of case as well. So our third and final example for this lesson reads as follows. Sunakse ton ochlan ha the daskalos tate are ten kaira autu kai our toys the ducks say rematar tase aletheas. 
So let's pass one or two words together. The first one is sunakse, and this comes from the lexical word sunago. So the gamma has amalgamated with the sigma of the future to form the xi. So now we have sunakse. So it's a verb, it's a future, active, indicative, third person singular. So we could translate this as he will gather together. Then we have tate. Remember, this is an adverb and it's translated as then. And then our last word uh, is array. And this comes from I row. So this is an example of a liquid verb. So in the future, the yota has dropped out and the contraction has taken place. That's why we have the circumflex there. So this is a future active indicative third person singular. He will take up. All right. So putting some of this information together, our translation could look something like this. The teacher will gather together the crowd. Then he will take up his hand and he will teach words of truth to them. So let's make some observations. Yeah, the first one is the subject is ha didaskalos, which is the teacher. That's why we have teacher at the front of the sentence functioning as a subject. The teacher will gather together the crowd. So here the crowd is functioning as the direct object of gather together. Tote, then he will take up his hand. And, and then the last part of this, this sentence is a little tricky. Uh, we see uh, our toys, which is in the direct, uh, not direct case, which is in the dative case. And we see rheumatars in the accusative case. All right, so that's why in the English, I've jumbled the words around a little bit. So we have, and he will teach words of truth because words of truth is functioning as the direct object and our toys uh, to them is functioning as the indirect object. All right, so um, we could translate this as, and he will teach to them words of truth. Uh, but I've just tried to emphasize the direct object first followed by the indirect object.